Good morning, everybody. January 3rd, 2021. Happy New Year! Did you think we were going to get there? I began to wonder a little bit during the year 2020. So, you're seeing a recorded message today because church is closed for the moment. The, uh, uh, the deacons, I think, made a very wise decision that in light of the pandemic numbers that were spiking post-Thanksgiving, that we're going to take a few Sundays and do virtual only services. So today is one of those Sundays, December 27th, January 3rd, January 10th. So today, January 3rd, 2021, you're seeing what would have been the message for December 27th, 2020. But you're still getting it fresh at the same time that everybody else is getting it. Uh, if that's clear as mud, <laughs> I hope I did a good job of explaining it. But the reality is this, uh, we did take a few Sundays to not meet together corporately just in case during the time of Christmas and the time of New Year's people gathered together as I hope that they have a chance to do that safely as we know that people did uh, and we want to be safe for everyone. We don't want to take any chances with your safety here at Mount Vernon so I hope that uh, I hope that you agree that we're doing the right things but we are looking forward to January 17th. January 17th, we will go right back to the sanctuary, uh, good Lord willing, and the COVID rates don't rise, as I have said. We will go back in the sanctuary on January 17th at 11 o'clock, and that will be our uh, regular worship service until we can get these numbers under control. Of course, if that changes, you will be notified through the usual systems, the remind.com that sends out text messages to all church members, as well as the Facebook Live uh, through the church Facebook site. So please keep up with those two things. Uh, we will do our best to get the information out to everyone. We certainly don't want anyone to be left out. We just recognize that so many people communicate so many different ways. So the text message system seems to work best. And if you have any questions about how to do that, do call the office 828-286-9294. And we'll try to give you a call and tell you how you can get onto the remind.com system. Appreciate everybody who's sending in their tithes and offerings during this time. It's been uh, been interesting not to pass an offering plate during the services, but we haven't done it in some time. And our needs have all been met, so praise the Lord. Our people have been faithful. So you can always send your gifts in through the mail to 2676 Hudlow Road, Forest City, North Carolina, 28043. Or the easiest thing, if you're a computer adept, is, of course, to get on the Mount Vernon Baptist Church website, MT Vernon. Baptist Church NC dot org and just click on the give tab and that'll take you to a place where it's just very easy to give online so happy new year I hope you enjoyed wrapping up 2020 I think we all did we're hoping for a better 2021 at least in terms of health and our ability to be able to get out and do God's work and to be able to be God's servants because what a privilege that always is I'm glad to be here, privileged to be with you this morning. We're going to be looking at the Gospel of John, John chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. John chapter 1, verses 1 through 14, from promise to person. I'm going to be talking about when the Word became flesh. Of course, we've just come through the Christmas season. We've spent a lot of time thinking about the concept of the Word becoming flesh. Three of my greatest moments of life came in 1992, 1994, and 1997. And if you figured out what that means, that was the birth of my three sons. When the promise of a child, the promise of fatherhood became real. Uh, when my wife and I were privileged to have three fine young men. My wife and I were married December 31st, 1988, so we just finished our Oh, help me with the math now. Uh, 32nd, 33rd anniversary going in 33rd year. I think that's correct. 33. Wow. Long time. Long time. And what a blessing. But the greatest blessing was the children that came along a little bit later. We were living in Silva when we got the word that we were expecting our first child. I'll never forget the excitement, the ultrasound, the childbirth classes, the total apprehension and confusion and anxiety of what did we do and what are we going to do from here forward but holding my son in his in my arms was a moment second only to salvation for me and you know if I could tell you that the top I guess 
four moments in my life. It would be uh, salvation and then the birth of my three children. Uh, marriage is up there. It's pretty high, but uh, the birth of those children was pretty amazing to see a part of you in your hands, to, to look into their eyes and to see a reflection of your past and to know and, and hope and pray that they're going to live so much longer than you and they're going to do all the things right that you did wrong. They're, they're the embodiment of your hopes, your dreams. Uh, I see in my children my strengths, my weaknesses, my habits, even my thoughts. I, I heard someone say years ago, you cannot help but grow up to be your parents. And that scares me because uh, I want my children to be so much more than I have ever been. Our kids are the incarnation, the incarnation of our hopes and dreams. We'll sacrifice anything, everything, if necessary, for their well-being. Imagine what Joseph and Mary must have been thinking when Jesus was born. Now, Joseph has my extreme admiration. He must have been the most humble man to have ever walked the earth. They lived in a culture that did not honor pregnancy outside of wedlock. Joseph was the stepfather of Jesus. You know, Jesus was conceived of the Holy Spirit. So Joseph was not his biological father, but Joseph stepped in. And for that, I, uh, I much, very much admire the person of Joseph. As the stepfather to God's son, what pressure he must have had. Do you ever think that uh, Jesus was taught by Joseph how to be an earthly man? Uh, do you think they wrestled in, in the house sometimes and Mary said, Be careful, you're going to break something. Do you think they did the, the ancient equivalent of whatever throwing a football or a baseball was at that time? Do you think they carved a slingshot or a spear and went out hunting or something? Do you ever wonder if Jesus, uh, if Mary and Joseph ever had to go to a parent-teacher conference at Nazareth Elementary School? Well, I'm guessing not with Jesus. But uh, as we think about all the things that Jesus went through, he was a human being. And Mary and Joseph were very much human beings. There was nothing supernatural about Mary and Joseph. I really wonder how Joseph handled the pressure of raising God's son. Mary, Mary also deserves supreme admiration. As somebody who spent a lifetime working with young people, wow, the very concept of this young teenage girl becoming a mother and having the faith to say, yeah, I'll, I'll be the, the vehicle through which God's son can be born to save this earth. And I'll take the shame, and I'll take the ridicule, and I'll take the derision, and I'll take the condescending stares, and I'll deal with the shame, and I'll deal with what everybody else perceives to be the guilt for a decision to be the mother of the Son of God. Uh, I've always wondered if Jesus had Mary's eyes or maybe the color of her hair. You know, being the Son of God and the Son of Man, which was Jesus' favorite title for himself, he should have resembled her. Do, do you ever wonder if he had some of her, her character in his life? Good or bad, we inherit the mannerisms and the traditions of our parents, the things we say, the, the habits, our personality, our faith. You ever wonder if Mary and Joseph were good members of Nazareth Baptist Church? I, I know I'm just making that up. There was no Nazareth Baptist Church. Please don't believe that. But, you know, they, they went to temple. I mean, uh, did they were they active participants? Certainly we hope so because we know that Jesus learned so much at the temple. We, we know that they were uh, obedient, good Jews for their day. Joseph and Mary were entrusted with raising the Son of God. The Word became flesh, and Jesus knew what it was like to be human. How amazing. Let's read that story, John, book of John, Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. 
the true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent nor of human decision, of a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. In layman's terms, the word incarnation simply means that God became man. Every other religion in the world teaches in some form that man can become God. Please understand that is the fundamental difference between Christianity and all other world religions. That's why Christianity is so much more than just a religion to me. Christianity is about God becoming one of us. Every other religion in the world teaches us to become a God. Big, big significant difference. Christianity is unique. Uh, Judaism was, was rooted in this strict obedience to law. It was a system of perfecting yourself through the concept of righteousness. Um, Thirty years ago, roughly, I was talking to a Hare Krishna. Only time I ever really had a chance to study the Hare Krishna religion because I'd talked to a guy for a while and he, uh, he pulled me out and I thought, oh boy, all right, I'm walking by. He wants to talk to me. I said, all right. <laughs> You might not know what you're getting into, buddy, but let's, let's take a go at it. And um, it was an interesting exchange because he was trying to sell me a copy of the Bhagavad Gita. So he wanted me to give him five bucks for publishing. And this is where my poker face came in. I, uh, after talking to him for a long time and trying to explain to him why I thought his religion was not real, uh, I finally told him, I tell you what, if you believe so much in that Bhagavad Gita, you'll give me a copy. He said, sir, I can't do that. He said, we have to cover our publishing cost. And I said, is it okay to tell a lie when you're witnessing? I said, I've got a Bible in my truck. I'll give it to you. I actually didn't have a Bible in my truck. so, But I would have given him a Bible. I would have found out where he lived and I would have brought him a Bible. So anyway, I've given away a lot of Bibles in my life. And, and had I had a Bible, I certainly would have given it to him. But I offered him a Bible. I said, I'll go back to my vehicle and I'll get you a Bible and I'll give it to you because I believe in the Word of God and I believe in the Son of God and I believe that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. And I believe it so much that I'll give it to you or anybody else that's here today. I'll give it away because God gave me salvation through His Son, Jesus Christ. He said, well, he said, I, I, we're, we're not going to talk anymore. That was the end of it. So, uh, Bhagavad Gita, Hare Krishna, fun people. All think they can save themselves. All think that they're out there hawking their Bhagavad Gitas and that uh, in so doing they're going to earn righteousness and make it to their version of heaven. Joseph Smith of Mormon fame even created the idea that you can work your way up to the first from the, uh, the first heaven in the afterlife in case you didn't get it right here on earth. A religion of works. Sorry, Mormonism. A religion of works. Um, Muhammad married a rich lady and began his own religion, corrupting Christian principles. Every time I hear people say we have Judeo-Islamic Christian principles, it hurts me because Christianity and Judaism are different from Islam. Islam is a corruption of Christianity. Islam is a corruption of Judaism. It's a religion of works. And it teaches that you can become God. Christianity teaches that God became man. How would we go about the form of sending God's Son to the earth? We would do what every other religion in the world has done. We would send a powerful, charismatic prophet to try to carry out our message. Now, me personally, if I had the opportunity to do it, I would pick out a guy like Thor Bjornsson. You probably don't know that name, but he's one of the guys that I've watched on the World's Strongest Men competition. Thor Bjornsson is such a big guy, six foot nine, about 350 pounds, has no fat on him whatsoever, 
He is an absolutely, he looks like a superhero to walk into a room. He, uh, on this particular episode that I watched, he was so far ahead of every other competitor, and none of these guys were small. Every one of these guys was 300 plus pounds of solid muscle, but Thor Bjornsson stood out above any of them. I would send him to every town. I would get him to stand in the public square and say, send me your champions and I will wrestle them and you will listen to me. And, you know, in every town, everybody would stop and Thor would beat up everybody that was there and he would say, now you listen to what I'm going to say. And people would follow him because they would want to be like him and they would believe that they could attain what he has through hard work. They would ascribe then to a religion of works to try to perfect themselves. Judaism. See? You understand how that works? We cannot perfect ourselves. This, this system was the uh, incubator for Christianity. This system of Judaism was the vehicle through which Christianity was delivered. And as, as Jesus was born to Mary, Jesus was also born out of Judaism. And our failure to be able to attain godliness. Jesus was a human being and he knew every temptation that we know today. C.S. Lewis, one of my favorite theologians, said that the one who knows the most about temptation is not the one who has succumbed to temptation but the one who's overcome temptation. We tend to think just the opposite. We, we used to, at least in days past, flock to crusades to hear the most vile of sinners tell their stories of a horrible lifestyle and then tell us that as Jesus saved me, Jesus can save you and he'll lead you out of all this to salvation. And people love to hear that. And, and people love to think, well, gosh, this person's done all kinds of terrible things. I know that Jesus can save me. C.S. Lewis would say the strongest Christian is not that person who failed, but the one who overcame. The strongest Christian is that quiet little old unassuming lady in the corner who prays every morning, who gives faithfully, who's in her Sunday school class every day. She might not be able to pick up a 10 pound weight, but she is powerful in her faith. Those are the people we need to emulate. We know that we can overcome temptation because Jesus was a human being born of flesh and he did that. And he did that to show us that we can do the same. He didn't come flying in here like Superman. He didn't, uh, you know, you think about Superman, that, that whole story. I mean, there's so many images there of Christianity because if you, you remember the DC comic book story, he was sent as a child and then Martha and Jonathan Kent, I believe, raised him to become a man and taught him. But they always said, son, you're something special. I think there's a lot that was taken from the Christian story in the, the person of Superman. But there's a distinct difference in, in the true Christian story because Jesus said, I'm the son of man. I'm the son of man. I'm just like all of you. He was the son of God, but he was the son of man. He was divine, and yet he was human. And he taught us how we could overcome sin through dying on the cross for our sins. John says it all so simply, the word became flesh. I love John's version of the Christmas story. No angels, no shepherds, no wise men, no manger. Mark first, not chronologically, but, uh, well, Mark was, yeah, first chronologically. I'm sorry, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We, we tend to think of that as being chronological order, but it's not. Mark, Matthew, and Luke, then John, basically chronological order. Uh, Luke has shepherds. Matthew has the magi. Uh, God became man. Simple and sweet in the book of John, in the book of Mark. It's just boom, like that. What does it mean for the word to become flesh? A.T. Robertson notes that the Greek culture used the term logos to apply to the natural laws of the universe, of reason, of wisdom, of the world order. Greeks would understand that the God of creation became part of his creation. Hebrews related uh, to verses like Proverbs 8.23, I was appointed from eternity, from the beginning, before the world began. The Jews saw the word as the power of the promise 
made years before to Abraham. We live in the power of that promise today. What are some of the words from the Word of God that give us this strength? John 3.16, For God so loved the world, that he gave his only Son. John 10.10, 10, I have come that they may have life and have it more abundantly. Uh, John 6.35, On the bread of life, he who comes to me will never go hungry. We can believe those promises because the Word became flesh. In him was life. In him was life. Chapter 1, verse 4. And the life was the light of men. John uses the term life 36 times, while the other Gospels use it less than half as much. He uses the word zoe, not the word bios. Of course, we get our word zoo from that, zoology and so forth, bios, biology, life, words. In Christ, we have more than just physical existence. We have zest. We have life. We have excitement. We have joy. We have hope. We have peace. We have love. We have more than just a pulse. We are living. And that life was the light of men. In ancient civilizations, light was symbolic of life. When a light shone in the darkness, it was a curious sight indeed in antiquity. I remember being on the rim of the Linville Gorge one night camping and I could look down in the valley and, and literally miles away I could see a light and I knew it was a campfire of other campers. There was a light shining in the wilderness and I knew where that light was that there was life. It is no wonder then today that the darkness hates the light because light shines truth upon the confusion of darkness. <sighs> In a movie I saw several years ago, I don't remember the movie, it doesn't matter, but a couple was invited to a Bible study, and they were so nervous. They'd never been to a Bible study before. It was uh, something they really didn't understand. And they, they came to the door, and the guy said, Hey, I'm glad you're here tonight. This is what we're going to study. They looked at each other, and they ran. They just turned and ran. They were scared. They were afraid that the topic of that night's discussion was going to shed light on their sins. And they were afraid of that. We don't have to be afraid. We don't have to be afraid if the light of God's love shines in our lives and upon our hearts. And, and you know what? If we're living in that light, walking in that light, we don't have to fear what might be exposed there. Uh, the world still does not understand that light, and it does not understand the life that comes with it. The, the world still does not understand the joy of Christian conviction. We celebrate in the wake of Christmas our Messiah coming to us, our deliverance from sin. In verse 12, we're reminded that all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. The good news, a great joy to all people, is that the child is still our bridge to access the Father. And we can be a part of the kingdom of God, the family of God, because we too have believed. We uh, Several years ago when we were taking down the Christmas tree about this time of year, it was one of those years that I, I don't remember exactly what year it was, but uh, we found a gift under the tree and it had not been opened and it was a, a CD that I got my wife of you know it's been a while if it was a CD right so I gave her a CD of Christmas songs by one of her favorite country singers of course it was January at that time and we you know we listened to it and then we set it on the shelf because it, it was there for the next Christmas but we missed a gift we opened all the gifts under the tree but we missed a gift are you missing a gift did you miss something during the Christmas season did you put up a tree and not open your heart to Jesus? You can get a great gift all year long by asking Christ into your heart. So let's start off the new year, right? If you missed it during the Christmas season, let's start off the new year in God's presence by giving your heart and your life to Him. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I pray for anybody that might be watching today that today could be a most blessed day, a day of salvation. Lord, I pray that all that we say, all that we do, all that we are, that we will lift up your name in our lives, in our hearts, in our actions, that the word will become flesh 
in our lives, that we will be the embodiment of your word to this lost world. And we pray these things in Christ's holy name. Amen. Well, folks, thank you for tuning in and joining us today. I will remind you again, in case I confused you completely at the beginning, but today is January 3rd. We will not be gathering on January 10th. There will also be a recorded or a, a virtual message that day. Uh, and I apologize for not being able to do these live. I've been over this with you all many times. We just don't have the internet speed to do live broadcasting from our offices here at Mount Vernon Baptist Church. So we do have to record these in advance. But you are seeing this today premiering for the very first time. Uh, so I hope that you've had a good Christmas season. I hope your New Year's off to a good start. And we will be doing a virtual study again on January 10th, a virtual service. And uh, we will look forward to seeing you on January 17th, live in God's house at 11 a.m. God bless.